idea was discovered or conceptualized, for that to convert into an economic opportunity takes a lot of hard work. And along the value chain, there is this gap there where a lot of ideas die. They don't make it to the market for a variety of reasons. And we were established to be one of the key players that would be able to bridge that gap. And we have the different funding mechanisms to help uh, innovators progress through the various stages of their innovation. And this is just to reiterate, somebody has already mentioned, we, we are an early stage investor. Most investors do not play in the space that we are, although there are some, some developments in the marketplace now. However, we, we are the ones that are mandated to engage with risk and determine potential out of high risk um, innovations and take the journey with the innovators until we determine if there is growth or if it organically do not make it because the market is surpassed. There are many reasons, but we are there to work the journey with the innovator, uh, providing them um, with funding which would be financial, but also we do provide non-financial support. Sorry. The funding instruments that I will be taking you through are positioned between the innovation value chain in terms of where do we begin and where do we end. And because we, we do serve the national system of innovation, so where we end is more or less around our financial muscle, our capability and our mandate where uh, uh, we can provision to support you up until a certain stage. And then however, we would still find uh, more partnerships that will be able to take you through other growth potentials, exploring market avenues, and also attracting other capital investors and hopefully get you to a point where you can even be attractive for MNEs, which would be measures and acquisitions and other private equity players. So, apologies, it's a bit fast for my fingers. So, I will, this is an overview of our main um, instruments. We, we do have a, a seed fund, and we have a technology development fund, and we have a commercialization support fund. However, the funds that I have uh, uh, mentioned in the slides are a bit more unpacked than the three high-level ones. This is what most of our stakeholders are familiar with. And it also shows you in terms of, let's just say, size or growth of your, your, your idea. At seed, it's, it's where it's still nascent, it's still high risk, you still need to validate a lot of metrics. And uh, the technology development, you are sure of what you're doing, <coughs> you need to have real muscle, real financial capital and resources to be able to implement what uh, 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 is uh, the goal at hand. And commercialization, it's around market-facing um, innovations. Along those lines, we do have other interventions that as we evolve as an agency, we were able to um, um, package through to, uh, to support our investees. So the seed fund, um, I'll, I'll be a bit fast because Tamani has already uh, did the outline. I'm just focusing on the actual instrument so that you know when you apply, based on where, who you are, where you are, and what your needs are, you know which instrument you're applying for. So the seed fund is where you you are sure that this you have you have a discovery. If I have to talk intellectual property language, you have a discovery that is worth uh, being entertained and being supported, and you want to be a real contender in the marketplace with your discovery. However. For that to come from your head to either a means of being protected and also a means of being conceptualized into something tangible that you can say this is now my IP that I'm going to work on. Respective of the stakeholders that Tambani has already mentioned, you would require seed funding. And we have an instrument for that um, at, at TIA. In our respective sectors, we are able to engage with you 
with your early stage um, proof of concept that needs to be worked on and you also need to validate some metrics until you are sure if you are going to be able to engage with the market early on or you going to need a bigger fund to develop that proof of concept. However, I must also have a disclaimer that um, it's very difficult to engage with an applicant that only has a concept that is still in their aid. Because we need to have um, a tangible proof of concept that we can work with, that can be uh, you know, stress tested to, to, to a fair evaluation me metric and to also determine the potential because we also said the shareholder that wants to know and we have to account what did we do with the money that we have invested in. The, most of our, our seed fund projects uh, coming from the varied uh, stakeholders can feed into our investment uh, pipeline where we'll be able to then pull them into the technologies that will eventually make it to the market. <clears throat> the next fund is the Technology Development Fund. This is a bigger fund uh, than the, the seed fund. Because with this one, you want to do, you, you have a working prototype that you want to do a full scale uh, technology demonstrator with. And you want to be able to have that confidence that this is what you had intended to do. And we support you with um, the funding. We, we determine what are the needs of that funding. We determine is it a viable uh, uh, innovation to fund. We also determine do you have the requisite skills and um, other supporting metrics uh, in terms of infrastructure or where are you going to be developing the technology with whom, do you have any uh, interested um, offtakes on the, on the cards or who are you engaging outside yourself that this innovation is worthy of making money or changing somebody's life. Uh, and this is where we help you to, to validate and have real life answers. We, we're not working in a, a very closed um, sphere where you, you just want money to do something, but you're not going to be able to benchmark it against um, what would be state of the art. That's also one of the things I have to mention that with T TIA, what we fund, we have to fund um, innovations that move the needle. We are moving from the current state of art to the next. So you also have to prove to us how competitive your innovation is and uh, what is their market potential. What is worthy to mention here with the Technology Development Fund is as much as the funds is to develop the tech, we also advise um, innovators that at this juncture, this is where you also need to look into how is your intellectual property strategy looking like? How, how do you want to protect that technology that you're currently developing? and uh, how are you going to form a business case out of that uh, technology? Technology on its own is not enough to, to hit the market. You need to start prepping to run it as a business for, for it to generate revenue. And you also need to start worrying about who you're going to sell this to or who is going to be your end user. The, the, the two are, 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 can be mutually exclusive. But there is a, a sustainability headache that is starting to creep in at this, at this level. Because if you don't validate what you have, you won't be able to know what is the market moving towards. So that's, that's one of the things we, 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 we advise our, our innovators to pay attention to and to start ramping up those um, auxiliary processes as the technology is, is now becoming solid. You also need to look into formulating a business case your IP strategy, and having early pilots that you can have that will give you feedback to iterate and improve quite quickly, rather than <coughs> waiting to find some um, truth later on that will not be in your advantage. When we get to the commercialization support fund, this is the part where you have completed your technology development uh, 
process or phase and you are facing the market. You, your, your worries are more around how do I find any offtake partners, how do I generate any avenue, uh, revenues, and how do I have um, field trials for my innovation. Is there any certification that is required for your innovation before other people can come and touch it? There's various industry certifications and other qualification methods that are involved in respective sectors. So you have to then now prep for investor readiness as well um, so that you'll be able to raise a bigger capital of money that will help you to um, commercialize. This is an, um, another intervention uh, that we, we, we formulated at TIA, it's called Industry Matching Fund. This, this was a way to also engage with the funding ecosystem to make sure that for every rent we, we invest in, in, a, in an innovation, there, there are other industry partners, predominantly private uh, equity or let's just say private investments that can come in and join to co-invest. Uh, the clue with these models is that we have to have a vested interest and strategic oversight over that innovation so that it's an ecosystem approach where if you, you there's either angel investors or other capital investors, we have to make sure that we put your innovation out there to attract. And these people, you need them because even later on when you commercialize, you're going to need them to flourish. So we're trying to pull them into our ecosystem early on and also teaching the ecosystem to engage with early stage technology innovations. The Innovation Fund is a, a fund that was established by our uh, Department of Science and Innovation. Um, last night's dinner, uh, the DG, Dr. Phil, did mention um, that we're celebrating early successes with this fund. This fund was also another fund that was created to make sure that when you commercialize, um, I'm not sure if you are aware, but our, our TIA Act uh, empowers South African intellectual property to be uh, uh, internationalized. If, if you have um, early market uh, ventures locally or regionally, we do encourage for, for our innovators to forge those partnerships, to seek those de business development opportunities and come to us and show us how is it that we can help them with those market-facing uh, dynamics and any e expansion type of um, 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 needs. And this is where we can now go access the innovation fund to support uh, uh, the, the innovators. And with this, with this one, we also need to make sure that at that point of where you are, you are actually creating a viable venture. You, you have a clear strategy of how you want to make your money and how you want to grow. And you come to TIA to help us support you to realize that uh, vision. I think in the spirit of time, this should be my last slide. I hope so. But I do thank you for your time. Melissa, and yes, we are running out of time, um, so I would like to kindly ask the next two speakers um, to stay within our time limit. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. So to introduce you now, uh, it's Dr. Kolisa Melemane, and she is a portfolio manager in commercialization in our agriculture um, business unit, and she's going to take us through the tier funding, the funding process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. This is a bit low for me. I'm going to try and lift this up. Yeah, this works. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and uh, thanks again, Elaine. So today, my intention is to just paint a picture on how we arrive at a decision of funding a proposal. So I'm just going to use general principles that we apply in the evaluation process. And uh, I'll try and be quick. <laughs> oh. So, um, oh, yeah. so 
if you see the same images, uh, it's just for emphasis, and my intention on this slide is to focus on that bridge where TIA plays in. And in the TIA funding process, the reasons that we come to a decision to fund any application are based on the ability that we are able to stage gate any investment and we come up with a product that we can present to the committee. We call it a project plan, a project plan and a budget or a technology development plan. So it is that technology development plan that enable us to cross that uh, chasm so that we avoid the value of death. So it is a reiterative process that we go through. So it's normally not sufficient to just uh, go online and apply and, and send all the documents. It, I'm going to illustrate here that there is a engagement that needs to occur such that we stage gate and do risk management on your potential um, technology development in such a way that it also is attractive to decision makers. So you have seen this before. And Shambani as well as Malese spoke a lot about the TRL levels. So here I want to emphasize the technology development plan. So uh, what matters now when you have your application that is submitted to us is that at the end of the day, when we complete the evaluation, we assist you to have a stage-gated technology development plan with clear deliverables, such that the money that you will receive is utilized in a responsible manner that give you uh, results that are taking you towards the market. And if you have a product that you are going to manufacture one day, then there should be some um, deliverables that are indicative that indeed you are moving towards your success uh, in TIA. What is important is that your technology development must result into commercialization and you must be able to sell something at the end whether you are selling a product, a service, or a process, but uh, you must be able to generate a revenue. So we have spoken about uh, the TRL levels. So in a complete uh, technology development plan, or rather if we put it clearly and say a project plan, you will have your technology readiness levels clearly defined based on the milestone you need to achieve together with market readiness levels in the same plan as well as how your entity is moving towards being a commercial entity at the same time. So in that evaluation process, when we believe in your idea as TIA, we also help you such that you are able to cross that chasm and have a plan that will make you end up with a tangible product that actually is a tangible product in a real life environment and can be utilized like any other product. So the principles we're talking about here today are cross cutting all sectors. So I'm going to avoid making an example uh, because these are the principles that should work for any kind of innovation that needs to occur. So, um, see so yeah, a little bit uh, about the process. Uh, most of our applications that we receive are done online and uh, uh, through our TIA website and there is guidelines there to assist uh, the potential applicants on how to approach their innovation, how to explain it to the funder or the potential funder. So I'm not expecting today that we recall by heart what is happening. So this presentation is merely for transparency and to dismystify any process that takes place and people feel that we're taking or we've made the decisions too early. So. Our applicants will either respond to a closed call 
that one would normally be based on the theme that TIA wants to address a certain technology gap in a particular sector. I work in agricultural biotechnology, for instance, if we want to develop biopesticides because now the regulations that are out there in the European Union or elsewhere are saying that let's move away from use of chemicals in food production, then we would need to address that and encourage potential innovators to then come up with proposals to address that over time. So that is one example. So a close call. So it's a bit competitive because you are all responding to a particular theme that has been predetermined that the outcome is going to be this or that. So we also receive applications in a what you call open call system. This one allows you to innovate in your area of your concern where you have identified a gap and say that this is where I want to operate or we get reference and other forms of getting. So uh, the most important thing we don't want to do is not to make any potential or applicant to work too much such that uh, they feel that I've put so much energy into this, I've supplied so many documents and yet I didn't get funding. So even our application process is stage gated. So we'll engage in a summarized form of the application. It's called the statement of interest, where you will have to, at high level, speak about the value you are proposing in a particular sector. So this one requires you to have knowledge of where your intervention or your potential intervention is at. So in that summarized version, then you are able to determine uh, if you have a real innovation, you will be able to indeed come to your expected end and early on uh, just maybe uh, apply a rejection at that point because maybe there is a gap that you didn't explain a particular uh, philosophy clearly so it allows you to go back and measure what the problem is or in a case where you didn't know which market you are going to play in. So that allows you to then look again at what you want to do and then you can come back and apply. So in an event where everything is in order, you were able to tell us how much work you have done, you have a proof of concept, or this is, these are the steps you have taken, these are the results you have obtained, these are the gaps you want to fill in in the money you are requesting from TIA. Then you go into a full application building phase where you have to build your application to address uh, in detail what is the technology development, in detail what is the commercial opportunity, what market are you playing in, who is the end user, what is the market, in terms of like details in the intellectual property, do you have freedom to operate, are you using someone else's process, are you going to get a license to use their process so that you are able indeed at the end of the day to trade. And uh, the entity you are, are you a university, are you a science council, are you an SMME, are you a cooperative? So those are the details that are required at full application. So that form is a bit bigger because you have to supply supporting documents. And then uh, and once you are submitting those, then there is a team at TIA that is allocated, they are specialists. So because they need to help you to develop that technology development plan or that project plan I spoke about at the beginning. So they are specialists, the other will focus on intellectual property, the other one will focus on um, corporate governance, is a legal specialist, will look at your entity, you are a PTY, LTD, who are your shareholders, and so on and so forth. And then the others will focus on the technology development, they are specialists in the sector you operate in. If you are a biotechnologist, you want to work and come up with a medical device, there is a specialist at here who will be able to assist you to come up to your expected end. 
So, and then we get into a process where we call a pre-DD, where we focus on these checklists I've explained for each of the specialists that certain documents must be submitted so that we can see, are you ready to then for us to conduct even a further investigation, which is called total due diligence, where we look at the team, the composition of your entity, how is your organogram struct structured, are you doing human capital development during this de development? Who are the other stakeholders you are going to interact with? When are third party funders supposed to come in? And then we come up with a de-risk at the end, a, maybe a recommendation. Most of the time at this stage is normally positive. We are going to approach the committees and then a, for them to approve before we can contract. So it requires a lot of engagement and most of the time this is where maybe like people get tired because they feel that they are being asked the same question or questions that are related. So those are the things we are looking to demystify in this boot camp and we become a little bit transparent. Why is that necessary? So we get into a high level agreement. It's called a, a term sheet. So some of the things as we have engaged extensively through due diligence, we're able to establish that maybe you don't have a bioprospecting uh, permit. You don't have an environmental permit. You don't have an environmental uh, permit to go impact assessment and other things. Or this is not feasible. How do we de-risk some of the things and we put them in that technology development plan? And some of them you have to provide before we even give you the money. And some of them, then you make them the milestones and the activities of your development. So that process, the evaluation process, is not about only measuring. If you measure up to receive money, it's also about to assist each applicant to reach the expected end. And then uh, at the end, then we approach a relevant committee. The bigger the amount you are requesting, then we'll approach a relevant committee who is able to approve that threshold. So Malaysia has spoken in terms of the different fundings and the stages where you can receive those different instruments. So those instruments, uh, just to maybe add a little bit there, they are meant to de-risk your your technology development or your commercialization plan. So we make sure that you have the appropriate funding for the stage of your development because other people come in early at proof of concept, others have already demonstrated in a real life environment through field trials that this works and those are eligible as she mentioned for technology for commercialization. And the different instrument is uh, instruments that were shared based on where you are actually operating. So I used big words here, eligibility. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not expecting anyone to, to remember the things that we are mentioning here. Uh, it's just an exhaustive list that the due diligence team has to assist with, even to unpack. Yes, I, I'm going to take one minute. Uh, to unpack that uh, idea or plan that is attractive for TIA. So um, also this criteria is applied during due diligence. We have to check if you are a South African or you are naturalized. We have to check what makes a plan stand out is the fact that your technology development plan is able to respond to the national challenges we have in the country, the national development plan. Are you going to create jobs? Are you going to have a social impact? Are you going to sell intellectual property? Or are you going to need licenses? And most importantly, is this deal that we have made with you attractive to another third party funder? Because our money only operates within certain legislation. And then third party funders need to come either by this business or by a, a, a stake in your business to help you to be commercial and generate revenue and improve uh, the lives of South Africans. So the most important thing that we want people to remember in this long list I've created is that 
over and above, you need to be able to translate your ideas such that they are responding because you know what you want to do. Then do translation that, yeah, hang on, in what I'm doing, I'm able to respond to the challenges that the country is facing. I'm doing more in terms of economic development or I am having a social impact and other things I have mentioned on here. So I have, there's a lot of uh, talk that has already happened about the innovativeness of your idea. And also entities, especially P2I, LTDs, those are the things, in, in fact, all of them, universities, science council, the compliance with the tax laws of the country and everything are important. So I'm just, my time is finished, colleagues. So, but we have uh, touched on most of these that are here on how you can position yourself as a potential applicant so that you can receive funding from TIA. And uh, we can deal with the rest of them uh, outside the venue or even contact us at TIA to better understand our offerings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melamane. And finally, we have uh, the head of our um, internal audit unit, Mr. Ricardo Apollos, to speak to us on TIA's onboarding toolkit. And as the custodian of compliance, I know he'll stick to time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, now it's afternoon. So, uh, as Elaine has indicated, I'm the head of internal audit and Considering compliance is key, um, I think we can accept that not only have we overdone, but there's probably a queue outside for potentially the next track. Um, so it would be unfair for me to continue as though everything is normal. Um, I, I would say two principles. The, the colleagues that came before me were talking about funding. They were talking about the money. The idea is that TIA needs to go beyond the money. And these are one of the mechanisms and tools to assist um, I, of course, had a bunch of anecdotes, there was going to be a whole storyline, um, but 10 minutes has now become 60 seconds. So the second principle I would leave with you is, in order to play this kind of proverbial game that is called tech and innovation, there's a bunch of things you have to deal with. Um, there's market related risks, there's technology risks, and often the things that we identify from an audit perspective are the simpler things. It's things like pure compliance when it comes to reporting, or just fixed asset management, things that should be simpler than the science, but those are often the gaps that we identify. So the idea behind this toolkit is that rather than tell you what you should have done after the fact, on day one, when you sign that contract, we can start saying, these are the parameters within which you need to operate. As an example, somebody may ask, is a business class ticket allowed? The question is, it's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> I've often heard, hey, if I'm going to Disneyland, um, at least it's considered staff welfare. True story. Now, if you didn't know that on day one that wasn't allowed, the project often goes, the program or the platform, how could we do something wrong if we didn't know what the rules are? This is that set of rules that you need to know on day one. So for all the potential in investees in the room, um, this would be useful on day one. For those of you that we've already contracted with, it's going to be useful on day 912 of 1,800. But at least it's an opportunity to implement it now. Because if you do have a scope creep, if you do have a minor budget deviation, what discretion do you have? What can you do within your powers? And what is considered a material deviation? All of those are unanswered questions. In essence, this, and, and like I say, there's a bunch of slides which we won't have time for because I anticipate there may be a level of engagement that is required. Um, I would rather propose than reading all these things that matter, um, we could just have a conversation using those details. So apologies, but I, I had three women come before me, so I, I allowed them. <laughs> to, no, that, no. <laughs> My three colleagues who happen to be, but, but thank you everybody, uh, apologies again. Thank you everyone for your time and your attention. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions, but Tia has a 
major presence there in the exhibition stand. So please come over. We are, there's many of us here and, and you can pose your questions to any of us. And as Polisa said, you can meet us outside as well. So thank you so much for your attention. Have a good rest of the conference. Bye. I, I couldn't even go to my notes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>